I'm Lena, and I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar. Um, I'm a lawyer and I'm based out of New Delhi and I've been working on access to medicines with Medicines of Frontiers for the last 15 years. I'm going to be your host and moderating this session for the next hour and a half or so. Um, I just wanted to sort of highlight that this is one out of four very important webinars on neglected areas of public health. Among them is the first, which is Hepatitis C, a silent killer. And before we go into the discussions, I just wanted to highlight a few house rules. One, that you're all on mute if you are a participant, but please, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and not on chat because the chat is disabled. Um, the questions and answers, uh, some of the questions I'll try and weave into our discussions, but also please feel free to raise them so that we can address them at the end. Uh, for Medicines on Frontiers, uh, just to give you a brief introduction to the organization, it has worked extensively on neglected diseases with neglected populations in conflict, in disasters, and marginalized populations. And most importantly, I'll ask Nason Tan to give the opening remarks, followed by a video that sort of showcases what MSF does in the field. So over to you, Nason. Thank you very much, Lena. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests. On behalf of my medicine and frontier colleagues from across the world, I would like to welcome you to the first panel session of our Neglected Diseases webinar series. As we kick off our one month long event with this live seminar today on Hepatitis C, I want to take the moment to thank you all for your endeavors during this challenging time that pushes everyone to re-examine our ways of dealing with crisis at the national and global levels. This pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities in the world's health systems. And MSF is organizing this webinar series to bring our focus back to some of the most prominent yet neglected diseases in Asia, overshadowed by COVID-19 headlines. This webinar series covers four neglected diseases, namely hepatitis C, measles, tuberculosis, and methanol poisoning. And we are honored to have invited medical experts and activists to lead the discussions. Today, we are bringing our attention to hepatitis C, a silent killer. Known since 400 BC, hepatitis C is a curable disease, but millions have no access to treatment due to jaw-dropping costs. Data estimates that only 9.4 million people worldwide had been treated with Hep CV treatment regimens by 2019, thus leaving 48.6 million people still waiting in the queue. MSF treats people with hepatitis C in several countries, such as Cambodia, Iran, India, Myanmar, and more. In 2019, our colleagues have provided Hep CV treatment to around 10,000 people. Of course, this number is far from eradicating this disease, and we continue to be advocating lowering the price and increasing accessibility of the drug treatment. We would also discuss impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on narrowing access to treatment for hepatitis C patients, in particularly challenges for hep CV patients and developing countries to control the disease. I would also like to take the opportunity to welcome and thank our panelists for this session. Duke NUS University Associate Professor Chao Wencheng, who also serves as a senior consultant of gastroenterology and hepatology at the Singapore General Hospital. John Michel Daniel, Southeast Asia Regional Director of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Last but not least, Tan Meek, who is MSF Cambodia's Hepatitis C Project Coordinator. Throughout this series of webinars, we hope to shed light on the ongoing but often neglected diseases. We want to actively bring together medical professionals who are dedicated to or interested in contributing to the endeavors of treating neglected but curable disease across the globe. Before I yield my time to our speakers, I would like to express how the past year and a half has been a roller coaster ride for medical workers, patients, families and beyond. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, there's still much left to do to ensure that all our patients have access to quality, 
affordable diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines. Today, there is a stronger call to solidarity more than ever. We will not let the COVID-19 virus exploit an already vulnerable population even more. On this final note, thank you once again for joining us, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. We look forward to seeing you again in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. And now we have the MSF with you to explain our work. I don't see what she's wearing. How he earns money. What phone he has. I don't see who she prays to. That she's a threat. Which border they cross. I don't see if he's a soldier. If he's a refugee. Which side they are on. I just see a child. A human being. A patient. Doctors without borders. Independent. Neutral. Impartial. Thank you so much. So thanking all the participants who joined us across the region, I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, quite shortly. Nathan's done a great job of introducing them already. So we have Dr. Chao Wen Cheng from the Singapore General Hospital. She's an actually extremely busy clinician who's taken time out to join us today. Thank you, Dr. Chao. And she's contributed to the guidelines on hepatitis B and outbreaks of hepatitis C uh, in Singapore in the past. So thank you for being here, Dr. Chow. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Jean-Michel um, with Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Uh, Jean-Michel has been based in Malaysia and heads DNDI there. And interestingly, DNDI, who works on neglected diseases, took on hepatitis C and worked in partnership with the go Malaysian government to turn around their response on the kind of innovations we see on hep C treatment and diagnostics and contribute to a tremendously successful response, even which hasn't seen a slowdown in the pandemic. So welcome, Jean-Michel. Um, thank you for being here. Thank um, you. We, yeah. Um, hello, Than Meek, uh, if you can have your video on. Uh, so Than Meek uh, has, uh, is a counselor and has been with MSF for a very long time. And he's a project, co uh, project coordinator in Cambodia for a project on hepatitis C which is turning out to be an excellent model in reducing the time taken from diagnosis to treatment. And I hope that model gets replicated across the region because it's benefiting patients in a manner that we could not have foreseen. So welcome, Than Meek, and we, we, we are really like to have your experience uh, in the panel discussion. Yeah. Um, so before uh, we go on uh, to the panel discussion, and I pose my first question to Dr. Jenny, um, I would like to, you know, highlight a poll that just sort of gives us an idea uh, about uh, the knowledge levels among all of us uh, for hepatitis C. So the first uh, poll is what is hepatitis C? Um, and you can just quickly click on one of the options and we'll see your answers. So should we just take 30 to 60 seconds to do this, I think. Oh, tremendous. So the outcome of the response uh, to the poll is that almost everyone is aware that it starts off affecting your liver and causes liver disease, one of the predominant causes of liver disease, viral hepatitis. Uh, and I'm going over to Dr. Chao Wen Cheng. Dr. Cheng, uh, you know, hepatitis C and I professional. Um, would like you to highlight why it's known as a silent killer 
And number two is what challenges do you see in Singapore in addressing viral hepatitis, particularly among vulnerable communities? Well, I think the two questions in some way is related. Um, so first, to answer the first question, why is it a silent killer? The reason is because um, in the case of hepatitis B, uh, particularly in Asia, a lot of it is vertically transmitted. So by the time the person becomes an adult, he or she may not even know that, you know, the mother who passes on the disease to him has hepatitis B, for example, um, and suddenly he feel well, and that's why you know it, it will not be a, um, he will not be conscious of it. And as for the case of hepatitis C, which is really the topic of concern today, many of the time people get the disease in just a spell of a second because of an incident, whether it's a needle prick injury, whether it is a bag of blood that has been transmitted, a contaminated instruments that they happen to use, whether it's for medical treatment or whether it is used for some aesthetic reason or for some people who use drugs um, using injection, that may be a mean, or other times even acupuncture and all that. Any form of injury that a prick that after a while, people even forgot about it, could well be a source of introduction of the infection. And after that, the person remained very well for a very long time. And by that, I mean, it could be as long as decades. And the only time that a person realizes he's unwell and present to a doctor is the time that actually the liver is entirely damaged. By that, we mean that, you know, the liver has become cirrhotic or or when we usually tell a patient is hardened, it simply means the liver is totally scarred. And a lot of time, it means that other than a transplant, you can't save the patient. That's one main way of presentation. And the other presentation is when the patient develops liver cancer. Of course, you know, having cancer is always devastating. And that is probably the two ways that the person present themselves when it is really advanced in the disease. But until that happens, the person remains very well. And that's why it is called a silent killer. And indeed, in many ways, it is a killer because obviously treatment of cancer or access to liver transplantation is always difficult. Um, which then relate to the second question that you were mentioned, you know, um, this this prob precisely because of the silent, then obviously people are not aware of it and, and very little can be done. And therefore, unless we consciously go and screen for this patient, especially the at-risk population, who a lot of time either they don't have the means or don't have the health literacy and therefore will not do it, then, you know, it will be a problem. Oh, thank you so much. So that leads me to my question to Jean-Michel. When, uh, you know, Dr. Shao says that, you know, we need to be screening vulnerable communities and coming back to Jean-Michel, if you screen communities, we have a larger number of people who didn't know they had hepatitis C and now end up with the results. Um, so when we started to work on hep C, treatment costs were tremendously high. When the new drugs came in, they were dollar, uh, sorry, a thousand dollars a pill. Um, we saw some generics out there from Egypt, which were a fraction of those costs. So what did Malaysia do to make the drugs affordable and bring in innovation for hepatitis C in the region? Yeah. First of all, I, I think, you know, what, one of the things we need to repeat, even before I answer your question about hepatitis C, is, is we have a cure, you know, and, and this is so unique. Uh, to have a disease now where you can think about elimination. And I think we need to constantly remind us of that and why it's important to talk about hepatitis C. So I think what, what the, uh, and this is why, um, you know, the, the Malaysian government has a commitment with WHO of elimination in 2030. And, and this kind of commitment is important. You know, people take it seriously. They come back home and they say, okay, we just signed, <laughs> we just signed a document where we wanted to eliminate hepatitis C. So where do we start? And then when you start with the price, the high price of uh, DAAs, these amazing drugs that are the cure, and then it starts to be a problem. You know, um, the price was 80,000 and uh, with negotiation, they only managed to go down to 10,000 US dollar for 12 of course, something a middle income country cannot afford. And, and, and so what Malaysia did is they engaged into uh, creating more competition, into uh, creating a, a competitive pricing environment uh, for DAAs, and it's, it's worked tre tremendously. So they use all the legal means available to, to, to them, but also 
And that was quite unique, uh, especially as we are talking here in front of a, a large crowd of MSF people. Usually when we do uh, advocacy for access, we start you know, with the patient's group, with the doctor's group. But here we started with R&D. We started yeah. with research and development, and we said we will develop a treatment. So even if prices don't go down, within a few years, we'll have a 300 US dollar treatment. And that, that was used as a benchmark to put it mildly, maybe a threat if you want to be <laughs> a bit more uh, campaigning. And, and it takes time, it takes years for, for uh, pharmaceutical companies to actually believe you, that you mean business. And then what we saw is price go down in Malaysia. And that was quite amazing. Uh, and very unique to have, uh, you know, to start with a clinical trial and to make it the backbone of an access strategy. Absolutely. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, Jean-Michel, when, uh, uh, when Malaysia did this, did it face any pressure? Did it receive any support? So what happened uh, when you know, Malaysia started to roll out this strategy? When, when you roll out a strategy like that, you have to use uh, all the legal means. And one of them is the TRIPS agreement. And once you issue a compulsory license, as Malaysia did it, at a certain point, I think Malaysia felt it was a real opportunity uh, by issuing the compulsory license to um, uh, uh, have access to affordable treatment and to really implement, implement a treatment strategy. So they did issue a compulsory license for one of the drugs, uh, so Fosbivir. From that point, it's, uh, it's hell. <laughs> Let's be clear, from that point, you have um, a lot of pressure from uh, uh, countries for whom you know the, the the patent rights is a kind of god-given right so you're talking about the us you're talking about the uk and and uh, the the relationship between governments and pharmaceutical companies in those countries as we can see uh, in germany in france not just the the uk switzerland uh, as we we can see with the covid uh, the, the, the collaboration or the proximity between government and these pharmaceutical companies is such that um, uh, for anyone who might not know, they actually use, you know, embassies, uh, they, they use the, the, the power of the countries to actually try to influence Malaysia or any country that, uh, that wants to use a compulsory license. So this is, all done. this is also done as a Frenchman. This is also done in our name. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, Jean-Michel. Uh, you know, MSF is supporting uh, the waiver of intellectual property on all COVID tools. So in some sense, it's, it's uh, good to know that Malaysia has used, uh, you know, safeguards to improve access. So Tanmik, I'm coming to you before we go into a poll, second poll, and we go into second round of uh, questions. Um, so Tanmik, what about the patients? You know, people talk a lot about public health and you know elimination. And what about patients? What kind of models are required to to make this uh, you know attractive or you know an incentive or more likely to get patients to to you know adopt this treatment as fast as possible so they don't get very sick? So what about the models that we are building for patients? Uh, before uh, uh, I'm here from uh, Cambodia and welcome. Uh, before uh, I mean uh, sharing the model that I'm a cyber developer here, I would like to uh, uh, share a little bit of uh, what was uh, like at the beginning of uh, the MSA activity uh, here. Uh, so far, uh, for hepatitis C is uh, like a new, uh, uh, I mean new uh, for. Uh, more age, they cope, uh, they have not uh, available uh, treatment at uh, the public health uh, facility. And uh, for those who uh, invite uh, ACV normally, uh, they uh, go to seek uh, their treatment uh, either at the private clinic here or uh, to the neighbor uh, country of uh, Cambodia, like uh, Vietnam, Thai, or Singapore. So I myself uh, come here to uh, bring uh, the hepatitis C, implement the hepatitis C in. Uh, in uh, 2016, uh, uh, and uh, uh, not uh, not provide only uh, the, the treatment and the care. We also uh, along the time we also uh, provide uh, try to uh, I mean uh, try to introduce the model of care that 
uh, uh, Amoe Cambodia could rule out uh, the access to, uh, I mean, to, to the population uh, here. So uh, after 2016, we work closely with the uh, uh, Communicable uh, Disease Department here to develop a national strategic plan to develop a annual operation plan uh, and uh, and the clinical guideline uh, uh, of uh, uh, viral hepatitis B and C. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it was uh, like uh, the budget uh, plan to allocate uh, to start. Uh, uh, to start in 2020, but unfortunately, the COVID come and we could not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, go as planned. All effort uh, that uh, we and uh, MOH uh, plan, it was stuck with the COVID. So, uh, in terms of the challenge or the issue that uh, uh, patient uh, uh, access to the, the, the care after the, during or the in the COVID situation, they have a lack of the budget uh, to support the hepatitis C. Uh, all, uh, I mean, uh, 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 resource of the health facility uh, move to uh, do either the intervention of COVID and vaccination. So uh, the patient, uh, also for the patient, uh, they cannot uh, uh, easily uh, I say because they are afraid uh, to go with the uh, with the government announcement that uh, should not uh, if not necessary uh, not uh, should not to go to uh, the I mean the uh, hospital or health center. Therefore, uh, they have a, it, it was uh, uh, the the challenge and also uh, they have uh, like uh, the in terms of mobilize mobilization uh, uh, of the people is not. Uh, they have a summary solution. So uh, it uh, was uh, more or less uh, the challenge that uh, for the people. And in addition, uh, the hepatitis C, as uh, uh, we share in the, the dependent topic, is a silent, uh, silent uh, killer. Uh, I think uh, the case of Cambodia probably uh, also with uh, the other country, developing country, uh, normally uh, where the health system was and, uh, not strong or uh, weak, uh, so uh, people will go uh, to the hospital to take up the health only uh, when they have uh, uh, the problem. So back uh, to the, yeah. the simplifier, uh, back uh, to uh, the, 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 the model care that, they, they, that we develop. Uh, at the, the beginning, uh, as uh, like I, I mentioned it earlier, they have uh, like a new model of care. So we try uh, to see how we do uh, in order to simplify uh, from a 16 uh, visit uh, that uh, at the beginning. And so, so currently uh, we have only uh, five visit uh, that uh, uh, it's a simple uh, with, uh, at uh, the health center, they can nurse at the health center, uh, could also initiate uh, the, the treatment while the complicated one was referred to uh, the referral hospital. So thank you, Tanmik. So what you're yes, highlighting uh, is... Yeah, thanks. So you, what you're highlighting is in that five visits you could get cured and uh, basically COVID requires us to rebuild some of these programs, uh, looking at the kind of uh, challenges that uh, health systems and patients have faced during the COVID pandemic. And I'm going to come back on, on that issue back to you. So it's time for the second poll. Um, so I'm going to open it up to the second poll before we go round to a set of second questions. So while we're waiting uh, for the second poll uh, results to come in, and I'm, uh, oh, fantastic. So almost everyone, over 90% people actually knew the routes of transmission, including unsafe injection practices, unscreened blood transfusion, and uh, contact with blood or bodily fluids of an infected person. So it's really great uh, to, to know that everyone sort of knows the routes of transmission. 
Um, and I also just wanted to sort of highlight um, before we go into the next set of questions um, that uh, please, you know, feel free to, you know, share this information on hepatitis C with, uh, within your communities. So I'm, I'm going to come back to Dr. Chow and there was a very interesting question uh, that was asked about a vaccine for hep C and someone said is, you know, uh, do we have a vaccine for hep C? Um, and number two, you know, um, if you can also mention what did you see during the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, other health services, but particularly on viral hepatitis and hep C, what were your observations of, of you know, people coming in and, and what happened to them? Yeah. Right. Um, well, unfortunately, first of all, there isn't up to now uh, an available vaccine for hepatitis C. So, um, you know, that's the not so good news. But the good news is that, uh, like, you know, our other colleague, John michel and Meek has mentioned, um, it ha we actually have a drug that is very effective in actually eradicating the infection. So I, I think that's the good thing. So if people are infected, if only they can be screened and picked up, we can actually cure the infection, uh, which is a little bit unlike of hepatitis B, which you mentioned at the beginning. So on one hand, hepatitis B has a vaccine, but um, we don't have a perfect drug that can eradicate the infection. But in the case of hep C, there isn't a, um, a vaccine, but we do have very um, effective cure for the infection. I do, however, want to bring up two points. Um, that is, eradicating of the infection does not prevent reinfection. So I, I think public education is, however, very, very important. I mean, earlier on, I think the poll is good that everybody understand and appreciate the root of transmission. So it is important that um, while, you know, like Meek say, within five visits, we get the person cured and basically the person can return to a community without worrying about, you know, um, especially if the person has not developed those complications I mentioned earlier on, we don't really have to follow up the patient and all that. But I, I, I can't um, emphasize more during the last visit before we bid our patient goodbye, which is what I do. I always nag at a patient and give them a lot of reminder and say that please be careful because you can catch it again. And I surely don't hope that you will need to come back for treatment a second time. So, so I think that's the, the first thing um, I, I think it is important to mention. Sorry, your second question was uh, COVID-19. Yeah, the impact of COVID-19 and so, what did you see uh, during the so not so bad because um, uh, precisely because the treatment of hepatitis C is relatively simple. So um, what happened is that unless there are patients who do not dare to come to hospital because they just feel that our hospital is filled with COVID-19 patients, especially during the peak of the infection, that may deter some people coming back to the hospital for follow-up. But otherwise, for those who come back, um, the compliance with treatment so as to lead to a cure is not an issue because precisely because the treatment is so simple. So as long as they come for the first visit and we kind of explain to them what treatment is required, that's easily done. I also want to mention that... Um, this, what COVID-19 has brought forward is the impetus of developing of digital health. So what really can happen is one can imagine after, you know, we have prescribed the treatment, they can get the test done in a lab and we can see the result digitally. We could actually convey the outcome of the, of the, the treatment as well as to give that kind of public health education through, a, a, you know, a, some kind of a, um, a media Zoom, for example, if not a phone call without the patient actually coming in and do not allow COVID-19 to stop us from continuing what we need to do. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, one of the things that I was really thinking about was that, you know, hep C was a bit like COVID that we have to, we can get reinfected and, and we need to work with vulnerable communities to provide them with the tools we need to, to prevent. Um, and, and I just wanted to sort of go back to Jean Michel on this issue with the question from China. And of course, you know, uh, a, a very important question about treatment gaps and what can we do about addressing them and uh, to, to reduce them. So I just wanted to ask you because, uh, you know, Malaysia is turning out to be the model for the region on reducing treatment gaps. So what do you, Jean Michel? So, so I, you know, I, I think the first. The first gap, whatever we hear, is that the, the price of the effective price of the AAs 
relatively to the uh, purchasing power of a country uh, uh, is still too high. So I will, by that, I mean that even though it might be 900 US dollar uh, for a 12 weeks course in Vietnam, it is still too expensive uh, to see um, a public health uh, strategy of elimination being implemented by the government. So I think DAAs, um, uh, the DAA price is still an issue. There's a, there's, a, there's a price tag, you know, it's like a bad marketing <laughs> or like marketing, you know, you, you, you can have this product at this price, but when you go to the shelf, it's all gone. And it's a little bit like that with the, the price of the DAAs. We, have, we hear low prices, but they are not available. So we need to make sure that these prices are really available in all of the countries. And we are far from there yet. So that's, that's a gap. The second gap is um, uh, in screening. And, and that's probably a, a difficult one. The confirmation tests is too expensive. You know? uh, so, so the screening, the rapid tests, you can probably get organized to get that at a very affordable price, but it, it takes leadership. Right? It, it, it doesn't happen again by itself. Governments have to have strategies. They have to take leadership in making sure there is a, a competitive pricing market for the AAs and for rapid tests. But then the confirmation test is more difficult. They are expensive. And, and so we need innovation there. It's very simple. And what I believe is um, we need innovation from the South. Uh, and, and one of the key countries or one of the countries that come to mind when it comes to filling in these gaps through a kind of a South-South collaboration as we have done with the Ravidasvir is of course China, but also India. You know, there's some very, very interesting um, uh, confirmation tests possibly in India. So I think this, you know, for me, uh, based on the experience we've had on producing a DAA, South-South collaboration is the way to go for many of the health issues that uh, we, we identify, especially in, in the endemic countries. We cannot just rely on this kind of, uh, you know, north-south relationship. We see with COVID-19, it's just not, not working. Look at, look at the massive gaps in access to vaccines because we rely on a very top-down, north-south approach or very high-income country. Um, um, to, to low and middle income country approach. So I think South South collaboration, I've been saying that, I will re be re repeating it as much as, as possible. For me, um, it's one thing to, to look at uh, the global health infrastructure and say, come and help us. But I think South South countries, uh, so low and middle income countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, these countries need to start to talk with each other and get organized to find some of the answers uh, to their problem. There is enough knowledge and expertise. And when there is not, then you can reach out you know, to high income countries such as Singapore, which I'm sure would be very happy to share some of their uh, knowledge. And, and, I, and I mean it, I'm sure, you know, they are very open to this kind of collaboration, but low and income countries have to be in the driving seat. You're on mute, Lina. <laughs> Absolutely. The regimen that DNDI and Ministry of Health and uh, Malaysia have developed, Rabidas, we can, and Sophos Bivit can be used in China as well. And I, I don't know how many of our viewers know, but Gilead Sciences is pushing very, very hard for the patent to be granted in China. And Chinese government is showing great leadership in opening up treatment for hepatitis C. And I hope, you know, um, we, we don't see the reversal uh, on, on the patent. So, yeah, absolutely. No, I, if I may, uh, no, I think I think you know typically um, China, uh, not just China. I think most, but but specifically China could take such a leadership in addressing the HCV issues. They have all the elements together. They have rapid tests. They have, you know, they have the drugs, and they also have the Ravidasvir, which is locally produced. The only thing that they have to be very careful about is granting the patent to Sophosbivir. Should yeah. they grant the patent to Sophosbivir, that's it. You know, the whole, the whole thing will collapse. You can forget about it. You know, the, 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 it, just that patent will block any attempt to have um, an elimination strategy in China. Absolutely. Uh, spot on, uh, Jean-Michel. And, and, and I think, 
this is something that we really have to take forward, both the South-South collaboration, but also, you know, to watch out that our elimination strategies are not undermined by intellectual property uh, uh, enforcement. Um, so I'm going to um, come back to a question to uh, <laughs> Hanmik again, one small question. Um, Hanmik, what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic to patients? Uh, in particularly, you know, in India, I hear that, you know, the drugs expired at the ART, uh, sorry, at the centers. And, you know, because people were not, we couldn't screen them. While uh, Dr. Chow shared yesterday that actually, you know, COVID-19 provided an opportunity in Singapore to test people and to provide them uh, with results they, they, of, of other diseases, including cancer and hep C. So what happened actually to people in, in COVID-19 in countries like Cambodia? Uh, for uh, for for Cambodia, uh, uh, I mean uh, the people who uh, I mean uh, the hospital, the public hospital, uh, if they have the problem, uh, they require uh, all uh, to test for COVID before uh, do uh, any uh, consultation uh, with the hospital uh, staff. So uh, I mean. Uh, 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 like uh, the, the people uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, want to go because they require uh, this, uh, even though uh, I mean they have uh, no uh, contact or uh, even they have no suspect case, uh, but they were required like uh, each uh, of a health facility. At the point, uh, uh, for all, almost all the, the staff at the hospital uh, shift their tasks. Uh, move their type to work on the COVID uh, to do the swab, to do the testing at the community and also uh, uh, to uh, busy with uh, the vaccination. Uh, yes, uh, like I like mentioned, uh, we have also like uh, some opportunity uh, to also to I mean, uh, propose the screening among the people who uh, come for, uh, for getting uh, the the vaccination, but this uh, was uh, like uh, uh, some place was uh, applicable, uh, some other uh, uh, was not applicable because the government used a different, uh, not uh, the MOA, but uh, they have uh, like uh, the medical staff from uh, the, the military. Uh, uh, then uh, they have uh, another boss and we need, uh, and uh, so they uh, more likely they, they push. Uh, only uh, for the, the, the vaccination uh, rather than uh, uh, to uh, integrate ACV uh, testing uh, inside, uh, uh, in this, inside the vaccination site. And also the vaccination site was not take uh, most of uh, the place was not take, uh, in uh, the, the hospital or the health facility. It was uh, take place uh, in the pagoda, uh, uh, the, the uh, garment factory, uh, the school. Uh, so, uh, uh, to provide also the SCV testing at there, you need to have like a small setup. So uh, it was also the, the challenge. And uh, for the key population, uh, 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 like the people who uh, are the uh, drug uh, injector, uh, mostly uh, the, here the government uh, continue to uh, cut down. So uh, they escape and uh, uh, they have also, we collaborate here with the one organization who will provide uh, this, uh, uh, the hepatitis C test and the treat, but uh, uh, we, lo uh, we uh, uh, lost uh, them because, uh, uh, I mean, the, due to anti down from the government. Okay, so actually that's quite interesting. So on top of the treatment uh, uh, testing required for Hep C, people were required to do the PCR testing for COVID, and that can be quite a barrier. And you know, already you're, you're sort of waiting for your viral load for Hep C, and you've got another PCR test uh, added to that. Uh, so another, you know, one step forward in reducing the time, and then two steps backwards because of COVID. So we really have to start thinking of strategies. Um, that will, you know, uh, you know, address the whole issue about COVID within health systems and, and health programs like Pepsi. So I'm going to go ask for the third poll before we take up the question and answers. Um, so it will be really great to have the third poll and, and we move to the question and answers. And I hope everyone can answer this accurately because we've been discussing this throughout the session. <laughs>
And while we're waiting for the poll results, uh, I just wanted to respond to what Jean Michel said about South South collaboration. Uh, India had developed a PCR testing platform, an Indian company, and that was very useful during COVID. And now it's being expanded to other diseases as well. Um, and you know, India is no longer uh, dependent on CIFID uh, for for its uh, screening of DRTB and screening for COVID. So we have competition for CIFID. Uh, finally, <laughs> from from a developing country. Oh, fantastic! Eighty three percent people, uh, you know, identified Malaysia as having, uh, you know, successfully developing the first HCV treatment through the South South collaboration. Thank you so much for for this. Um, so, can I, gonna, yeah, can I, go uh, ahead. So, so Please I think you know, you know uh, uh, what is very interesting in this uh, South South collaboration, and and this is why I keep insisting on on you know middle income countries having to start to really to talk talk to each other like for example we as you know in terms of screening lena as you mentioned reach out to india rather than reaching all, always to the us and you know the south south collaboration it's it's interesting it's not of course not all the know how and expertise was coming from malaysia and egypt which were the two main partners with uh, thailand in south south collaboration but uh, most of the money the vast majority of the money put into the development of that drug came from Malaysia and Egypt, which is, you know, people say, oh yeah, what about the financing? What about, but I think when, when country really see how um, this innovation can actually directly benefit them, yeah. uh, when they are in the driving seat, when they feel they are really in charge and not being uh, used just to do implementation, there is money. I'm convinced about that. There's money and there's political will also that, that we've seen in, uh, tremendously in, in Malaysia. And, and I hope some of the South-South collaboration yeah. will pull through uh, for, for the mRNA vaccine as well. Thailand is showing some uh, great, doing some great work on the mRNA vaccine. Um, so I'm just going to go over the questions and Dr. Chow, there's okay. one question about choosing which DA combination. And I'm going to give that to Jean-Michel as well because sometimes it's about price as well. So, um, you know, a, a clinician has asked, you know, which combination to use uh, for, for hepatitis C. So over to you on the medical side. Um, well, actually, I think nowadays, honestly, the answer is relatively simple because I think we shouldn't look at medication as the only thing because you should look at how to treat the patient as a whole. So um, just now, Ms. John Michelle was just mentioning the expensive uh, PCR test for confirmation. But beyond that, you also need to do genotyping if you start to think of what combination. So nowadays, there are pan-genomic drug, which means you know the combination uh, um, that actually take care of anything from genotype 1 to genotype 6. And you know if we can have some of those um, uh, uh, strategy that John michel mentioned, then instead of going into specific drug, if you can find a pan-genomic drug using some of those financial strategy that you mentioned, I think that should be the way to go. Then you actually can if the drug is safe, is a, is, has proven to be safe and effective, and it's cheap enough, then you don't even have to worry. You can save one test, which is genotyping. Absolutely. I mean, it's Thank too much so to talk much. about all the different combinations. Exactly. Thank you so much for that response. And John michel I think that was DNDI's attempt to, to come up with a pan-genotypic affordable yeah. treatment, yeah. wasn't it? But we, we came up with one combination, but we are supporting all the pan-genotypic version, you know, we, we, we think uh, any, as, as you just mentioned, Dr. Cho, any pan-genotypic version that is available uh, should be used. Uh, for example, the soft uh, uh, it, it still remains the, the, the combination that has been used to treat the vast majority of the patients across the world. And it's, you know, people say it's not so good, it's not so good. I think it's definitely good enough to treat patients. It's yeah. the one used uh, across the world. So, you know, any, any uh, combination is good, but I think it has to be affordable. And sometimes uh, the only way to do that is to create more competition between this combination. And that's what Malaysia has done. So in Malaysia today, you have actually three um, combination of pangenotypic. You have the soft dyke, soft bell, soft avidas uh, which is seen as pangenotypic in, in Malaysia because it covers all the genotypes in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So, so I think that creates, you know, uh, uh, creating a competitive 
environment where prices can go down uh, is, is very important, especially for low and middle income countries. I think high income countries have a different choice, which is you know, um, uh, their choice, where they can afford uh, to pay for high, high uh, price. It's a case uh, mostly in Europe, it's a case in Singapore, it's a case in the US. But I think for low and middle income countries, um, you need government to really uh, take the lead in, in, um, in creating a competitive uh, environment so that prices go down. Because even if you look at the voluntary license model, which has been implemented, uh, just, you know, it, just by itself, it has not, it has not brought the price is down as much as it should be, for example, in, in Southeast Asia, in Laos, in Cambodia. In Cambodia, the price is, is, is affordable thanks to MSF negotiations. Huh? Um, and hopefully they will uh, be able to transmit that low price to the Cambodian government. But Laos, Indonesia, for example, in Indonesia, it's still more than a thousand US dollars for, for a 12 weeks treatment despite the fact that Indonesia in the voluntary license. So you, you do need some, some uh, leadership and a bit of an aggressive uh, approach by government to make sure that uh, there is competition if you want to see the prices go down. Absolutely, spot on. Um, so I think th this is something that sort of comes out in almost all areas of healthcare that you know, governments are key to, the, to creating competition, reducing prices. Um, and I just wanted to say that before we sort of uh, end and you know introduce our other webinars that are going to follow this one and and of course uh, I just wanted to say that there's a question about uh, do we have data as to the number of deaths of hep C compared to other contagious diseases in Asia and WHO has been putting out a fantastic map on uh, hep C burden you know and 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 there's a lot of data on on the hep C burden for example India has significantly high Nepal Thailand Malaysia China this Asian region is actually endemic to hepatitis C. And I would encourage you to look at the WHO reports to, 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 to find out more about it. Um, and on the issue of the pandemic uh, sort of, you know, seeming more, more dangerous. And I think uh, the issue about the pandemic is it that it, it has uh, uh, taken a lot of a healthcare infrastructure to, to addressing the pandemic. And I think because the pandemic is here to stay, we really have to now re-strategize and, and, and I think we can't do that in this webinar. So I'm gonna stop at that. Uh, and I'm going to you know, thank all the panelists. Uh, uh, thank you so much and lovely being introduced and reintroduced to all of you all. And I wanted to sort of reinforce uh, that there are three more webinars, um, uh, there are three more webinars that are coming up. Um, one is on uh, methanol poisoning, one is on uh, TB, and of course, you know, drug-resistant tuberculosis, again, one very big challenge in the region. Um, and I would encourage you to register for them. Uh, if there's a slide or something, uh, I just wanted to ask the hosts, uh, you know, MSF Hong Kong, that do you want to share the slide um, on, on uh, the follow-up uh, webinars? Excellent. Uh, so it's a, it's a spotlight on neglected diseases, uh, and we are going to be having it in the following three weeks. So we have measles, um, and of course, in, in our vaccination programs for COVID, a lot of these older diseases are getting overshadowed, and their vaccination programs are getting overshadowed. Uh, we have methanol poisoning, uh, a significant issue in Cambodia, in India, and in a number of countries. And of course, we have uh, tuberculosis, who's, uh, you know, uh, had a huge setback due to the pandemic, tuberculosis services, but of course we have got drug resistant tuberculosis. So feel uh, uh, free to, to join all of them. And I'm, I'm just uh, wondering if uh, I can take a couple of more questions um, and uh, ask the panelists to answer them. Oh, there's a very interesting question that came in uh, prior to uh, uh, this webinar and that was a question on uh, whether you know a person can undergo a renal transplantation if they have C. And I just wanted to uh, ask Dr. Chow, but I also wanted to say that you know, if irrespective of whether you're HIV positive or you are Hep C or Hep B, any kind of life-saving intervention cannot be denied by healthcare services. Uh, so you know, you would have to take the precautions, but you would have to provide whatever treatment that would be required. Uh, and if not, that would amount to discrimination. So Dr. Chow, how do you deal with these issues of people coming in for surgery and transplants and having HIV or Hep C and what do you do about it? 
So I think there's two layers to this question. In fact, there's also another question in Q&A about pre-screening of surgical patients, but I'll answer the question you pose first. So the two layer of the question is this. Number one is what you do with the patient who require a transplant while he have another condition such as hepatitis C. And the other one, which is what you're suggesting is that should a person with hep C who can potentially transmit to the healthcare worker be given a treatment? Because to be honest, I'm aware of some doctors or healthcare workers um, feel hesitant to take care of a patient, especially the surgery if the patient has an hepatitis. So I think um, to answer I've answered the second question first, which I agree with you. No patient who happened to have HIV or Hep C should be denied treatment. But it also means that the healthcare system should have developed a robust enough process to make sure that the patient, uh, the healthcare worker who is delivering the care is protected, that they have the proper SOP, such that there's no reason for the healthcare worker to deny the patient the treatment. Because there's also another layer of thing is that you should, you should treat that patient, but if the healthcare worker get infected, he can be a potential risk to infect other people as well. So I think there's a there's a part that the health system has to do to make sure that's okay. Then of course, there's no question that I think you have to treat. Uh, you should treat the patient, and and we should do that. It's just that to be honest, it's so easy for a healthcare worker to give a reason that you know it's too late, it can't be treated when it have, there may be other reason that the person don't treat. So the health system has to be robust. But there's also another situation, which is um, if the patient is having an elective surgery, there's no rush. It doesn't mean that you have to treat the patient to have the surgery like within the next two hours. You do have time. In that sort of situation, there are two things, um, which part of it is that question that was raised in a QA, and a uh, which is if the patient doesn't know he or she himself has had B or C, uh, can you do the surgery for the patient? And I think for that, I would say that the, the, um, as part of the SOP, the hospital should develop um, a protocol to do pre-surgery um, hepatitis B and C testing. And they are not PCR tests, they are just serology tests, like an antibody test, which is cheap enough. But it's so important not only to protect, number one, to protect the healthcare worker, number two, to prevent contaminated instrument to be transmitted to yet another patient. And number three, it is actually a way of screening to pick up that patient who is coming for surgery, but found a way for us to find out that he has got hepatitis B and C and get that patient treated after the surgery. So it is actually a, a, a opportunity to screen the patient who happened to come in for something different. But for the transplant patient that you're talking about, the issue to consider is yet again different. And that's because after the kidney transplant, the patient will be given drugs that is meant to protect the tr transplanted kidney organ. But that drug is going to render the patient what we call immunocompromised or the immunity will, will, will dampen. And such that if the patient have hep C, the hep C will become rampant and it will be bad. So in this day and age, when you have very effective drug for hep C, the right thing to do is to treat the hep C, get a person cured from hep C, then go for the renal transplant. And you don't have to worry about you know, the aftermath after the renal transplant. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm all for screening when it's it's to give treatment to, to people, you know. Uh, mm. So uh, screening for discriminatory practices is out. And what you're saying is screening where you have an opportunity to actually... Yeah, so it's opportunistic screening. Yeah, exactly. To link them to, to treatment and services. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to come back to you all for, for last concluding uh, thoughts. But John Michel, there's a question for you, and and the question is from uh, uh, on China, saying that you said there's just one missing element in China uh, towards the elimination plan. So just sort of, you know, uh, I think you mentioned it earlier, but maybe you know the person wants, uh, you, um, I think it's Stan who who wants to clarify that mm -hmm. that that uh, issue. Yeah. So oh. what's the missing missing uh, <laughs> part on uh, China's elimination plan? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, uh, the, you know, the, the first missing thing is is for China to put in place all the elements which it has. That's, so that's what I said. You know, I think if you look at the potential of China, it has all the elements of an effective uh, elimination strategy. They might not be in place yet, and it's it's like that in many countries. I think if you look at many countries, there's a, a bit of organization to do, but a lot of the elements are there to um, implement effective public health strategies of elimination. 
The one problem of China is that it's one of these higher middle income countries that um, is too, uh, you know, cannot afford the very, very high uh, cost of DAAs, like in high income countries such as uh, Europe or, or, or Singapore. But it's, it's uh, too rich to have access to what is called the voluntary license scheme that have been put in place by uh, some of the companies to have access. So, so it's really caught in between the two. And um, at, at the moment, the, the license or the patent for the Sophos Bivir, which is the backbone of most of the, the strategies, is pending. And uh, if that is given to, uh, uh, to Gilead, in a, uh, then, then they, will, they will really be a bit uh, stuck. And it's a shame because uh, China has invested a lot, also a lot of money in the development of the AAS. Huh? So the, they also developed their own version of the Ravidasvir, the molecule that we develop with uh, Malaysia. So they also have potentially access to uh, affordable DAAs uh, pending that issue of uh, the supposed BVN. So I think uh, that's what I mean. So first of all, it's a big country. So it has to put in place all the elements, but I think they are there. And then so first BVR remain a big issue for China as a higher middle income country. Yeah, I think uh, as a treatment activist, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so we are almost at the end and we have to do our concluding remarks. And uh, one last, uh, so maybe we can combine it and make quickly is a question about how we can ensure that uh, HCV patients are treated well in the community and the workplace. And if any other thought you have uh, before we end the webinar. So please. Uh, over to you, Tanmi. Yeah. So, so the question uh, uh, that was asked was, uh, Tanmi, that is there any way that we can support a patient to be treated better in the community or the workplace? Uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of, uh, reaction or discrimination they face uh, because of Hep C. What can we do to sort of mitigate that? To reduce uh, that. Uh, I mean, uh, for for I mean uh, to achieve the like uh, the the target uh, uh, elimination target uh, by twenty or thirty. Uh, first, in Cambodia context, they have uh, uh, we find out uh, for for the hepatitis C, uh, it uh, the prevalence is around one point six. Uh, among the general population, but uh, for the those who are 45 years old and uh, elders, it's uh, uh, it's uh, about uh, five to six uh, percent. So in in terms of to eliminate, uh, I think uh, we need to uh, target the whole population. And in, uh, for the MOA now, the uh, MOA now, they rule out uh, the patency with the simplified simplify a model to the they call uh, operational health district uh, in the country. So uh, uh, for, for that, uh, uh, with the simplification and also uh, uh, the rule out uh, with the, the, I mean, the easy way to implement, uh, I think it will be uh, achieved uh, uh, the, the target of elimination. Thank you, Tanmik, and uh, I guess by curing people, we're reducing the stigma and discrimination against Hep C as well. And thank you for the explanation on the simplified model. So, Dr. Chow, over to you for your concluding remarks. Uh, yeah. Well, I really um, want to thank people like MSF and you know DNDI, like John Michel, who has done so much, who can lower the price for all the medication. And I think that for the next important if not equally important thing to do is screening because we can only um, you know act on what we know if we don't know we can't act so I guess the concurrent effort of making access of treatment should be the making access of, of screening and I think the other important thing I mentioned it at the beginning is that we can't wait for people to come to us for screen so opportunistic screening is important going to the, the at-risk population to screen is probably very important as well. Yeah, I, absolutely. Let's take the testing to the people. Is, is, thank you so much for saying that. Uh, so Jean-Michel. You know, I, I, I would like to come back to uh, what Mika said. I think what Cambodia has done in terms of uh, simplification, decentralization of treatment, uh, both the MOH collaboration with MSF is amazing. 
And when we talk about innovation, this is the kind of innovation we want to see. We will not, as Dr. Shaw said, the, the challenge now is to find the patient, is to invite everyone to, uh, to come forward and get uh, tested if they have one of the risk factors. And then uh, we can only do that if we simplify, if we decentralize uh, screening and treatment. And, and what has been done in, in Cam Cambodia, also in Malaysia, are a typical example of, of uh, what needs to be done in the region and beyond. So I think for us, the, the challenge is to, to take the experience that these, kind of, these countries have and to, to see how we can, um, again, in, in, uh, through partnership, through collaboration in the Global South, between Global South country, how we can um, uh, use this experience and, and implement it in other countries or, or, or use it to encourage other countries to uh, have such strategies. I'm talking about, for example, Bangladesh, I'm talking about Indonesia. Um, China could play a leading role, I think, in terms of uh, access to H, uh, DAAs and, and HCV treatment. So for us, it's to continue being a catalyst so that we see more the emergence of these new players uh, in the global south taking the lead. I think, I think HCV is a disease where um, uh, low and middle income countries can actually take the lead and make a difference. And I want to see that happening. And that's uh, the call from the NDI. And that's what we will be working on uh, in the future in the next years. Yeah, I think that's really great if we see more countries joining Cambodia and Malaysia on the response to, to hepatitis C. Um, I just wanted to share uh, that Sarah from MSF has put out uh, links to our neglected disease uh, uh, webinars. And she's also put out links to information on hepatitis C itself. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, and uh, can we have the last slide so, you know, uh, so that we can sort of end the afternoon. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, lovely knowing all of you all and we'll be in touch. And of course, uh, you know, MSF works in uh, with very excluded populations and with very marginalized communities in difficult to reach uh, areas. Uh, for example, in Manipur now, uh, MSF is uh, Manipur in the northeast of India, um, where we treat Hep C and HIV and TB among drug users. Uh, we are also doing a COVID-19 response. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and giving us your time.